All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to today's USANA Athlete live stream. If you're new to the show, thanks for joining us, and make sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you stay up to date on all the athlete live streams. Um, so, all right, I'm going to get right into it. I'm excited for today's guest. He's an Olympic alpine skier, two-time World Cup gold medalist, and he took a silver at the Downhill World Championships. Please welcome our USANA athlete, Travis Ganong. I hope I said that right. I should have yeah. asked you before right. we went up, live. <laughs> Welcome to today's so, USANA athlete live stream. I am uh, hearing some. Do you hear that? Us. Yeah. Yes, Thanks. that might be from your right. computer, that actually. Bell. I think that's so from you your computer. So if you just want to mute it okay, or, or turn yeah. the YouTube down. So right. I told we'll Travis right to go watch the YouTube yeah. live stream so he yeah. can interact with everybody uh, live yeah. and, and yeah. get to your comments. So. If it ends up being an issue, Travis, you can just, you can turn it off because I got it on, on my screen. But, um, Here we go. anyways, go. um, looks like we've got a handful of people on Sangbok, uh, says good evening. I, I know I'm not saying that right. Sorry, but good evening. Hope everybody's doing great. So I just want to give everybody, if, like I said, if you're new to the show, um, what we're doing here is we're opening the questions up to, uh, to the live audience. So if you have a question you want to ask Travis, it can be about anything. I mean, his favorite color, uh, whatever you want to ask, um, we'll, uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. But while we wait for people to jump on, I have a few questions for you, Travis. Um, first off, I, I appreciate you doing this with us. This is awesome. Um, Great to, great to have you on board. Uh, you're, you're fairly new to the USANA family. I think it was, it's just been a handful of months, and uh, it's been an exciting uh, exciting partnership. We've, we've loved having you. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much. I mean, I, I don't get that much time uh, to do this kind of stuff, so it's really nice that it worked out, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you and the audience and just kind of sharing my story a little bit of being a professional skier. Uh, I've been on the U.S. ski team for... 15 plus years now and been racing on the world cup for the last 10. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm for sure a veteran, uh, <laughs> entering veteran status, but, um, yeah, I mean, I love skiing. I grew up in the mountains. This is my, my lifestyle. I'd be doing this even if I wasn't a racer and doing it professionally, I'd still be skiing just for fun. So yeah, yeah. stoked to be here and looking forward to hearing you guys questions and yeah. That, that, that's cool. Um, uh, looks like Mandy says, Hey guys, What's up, Mandy? Hey, Mandy? Mandy's actually my wife. She's very <laughs> supportive. <laughs> so um, before we went live, we were chatting about your hometown, Truckee, and, uh, and growing up in, in the Tahoe, what do you call it? The Tahoe Valley, Lake Tahoe? Yeah, Tahoe City, like the, the North, North Shore of Lake Tahoe. So the North Shore encompasses, yeah, Tahoe City, yeah. Kings Beach, Truckee, um, and then Squaw Valley, Alpine Meadows are like the two big ski areas that are right here at our doorstep. That's, that's my favorite part of Lake Tahoe is the north part. Um, I we, agree. <laughs> we spent a handful of uh, time there. Uh, we did end up going down south one time and thought, ah, no, we like it. We, we ended up spending more time up north. So we're yeah. like, ah, why, why did we even get, uh, get, a, get a room down here? I mean, the whole, the whole lake is beautiful. And I don't yeah. know, I'm sure some, some people watched uh, like that NHL game they had at, at south, in South Lake Tahoe the last two games. They had the, the NHL outdoor um, hockey games. And yeah, I mean, South Lake's beautiful, but I love living up on the North shore. It's just like smaller tight knit communities and a lot of really passionate mountain people choose to make this place home because it's a perfect training ground to be a, a mountain athlete. And yeah, it's a really cool community. So, I mean, really it's, it's a perfect environment to, to train as any kind of an athlete. I mean, you're yeah. up, you're up what 6,000 feet is the lowest you get right around there. And it, and it only goes higher. Um, I, I was supposed to do my first triathlon yep. it, uh, there and, uh, we ended up, I was on the beach. We were five minutes from, from the whistle blowing and for, for the start, but they ended up canceling it because of the fires in California that, yeah. uh, you know, it cleared up Friday, Saturday was beautiful and the race was on Sunday. And then Saturday night, you could just see the clouds rolling it well they looked like clouds but i mean it was just a wall mm. of smoke 
No, I remember that. That was crazy. That that event had a tough time because I think the year before it it snowed. Snowed, yep. <laughs> snowed right before the event, and and the the roads were a little bit too slick, too treacherous for the biking leg, and the water. It was pretty cold to go jump in the lake, and yeah, yeah. It, I mean, living in a mountain environment, yeah. There's there's all sorts of weather variables that we have to deal with, but on any given day, there's always something that's like the perfect activity to do, which is why I love living here. Like when it's super windy in, in the winter, even in the the fall, you can go surfing on Lake Tahoe which is unreal. Wow. And then the, the wind storms pick up right before the bit that like the precipitation yep. starts. So yep. it's windy, you get a couple hours of surfing and then all of a sudden it starts to snow. And then the next day you can go ski powder and, and then the sun comes out for a couple of days and you can enjoy the sun, go back country skiing. The, the snow pack is really a lot safer here than a lot of other places in the inner continental U S. Yeah. So like this specific maritime snow pack allows us to go out and back country ski a ton, which is like one of my favorite types of skiing. I'm a, I'm a ski racer, but, but yeah, I grew up, backcountry skiing like big mountain skiing i raced cross country nordic skiing okay uh, and also alpine obviously so yeah. ski racing yeah but so that leads me into my first question while we wait uh for, for for people to start asking but um how fast what's the fastest you've been clocked on your skis because i saw on your instagram and for for anybody watching if you want to follow Travis on Instagram, he's got an awesome page. It's uh, it's it's right next to his name, his uh, his handle. It's just at Travis Ganong. But uh, on one of your posts, you uh, you you talked about how fast you went, and it was in kilometers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to I had to whip it out and 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 figure it out, figure it out in miles per hour. But uh, but I don't know if that's the fastest you've ever gone. But I know that's a fast track i guess yeah so in in kitzbühel austria about a month ago um it's the famous hanenkam run and it's a big event uh the biggest event of the season i mean it's kind of the super bowl of ski racing and and the hills super fast gnarly big jumps and this year the snow was really fast and the bottom like it's called the zeal shoes zeal means finish in german so the zeal shoes um yeah i I had the top speed i think it was 150 kilometers an hour 150 kilometers an hour yeah which is like 90, I don't know the math exactly, but 90 something. Hey, anything yeah. it, with a nine in front of it is yeah. crazy fast on skis. I mean, being able to, to go that fast without the assistance of a motor, like just gravity, yeah. snow, and and my body is my engine, I guess. So like, yeah, it's it's a weird feeling. Like when you're going that fast, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. And, and there's a jump, there's a finish jump. So we're going 90, 93, 94 miles an hour off the finish jump. And I think the, the jump was about 120 yards. So like a football field plus the both end zones just for perspective. So we were, we we're going 90, 95 miles an hour off of the jump into the finish. And this year was definitely like on the limit of what's possible on skis. There was a couple bad crashes and, and they had yeah. to, they had to shave the jump down and it was, it was on the limit, but yeah, I, I thrive in those environments. I love, kind of pushing my limits and finding what's possible. And, and I grew up like jumping off stuff. I love, I love jumping on skis. And so for me, it's like, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in the air. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was, that was on the limit. That was, that was crazy. So <laughs> I just started skiing. This, this would be my sixth season. And uh, I snowboarded when I was younger, but I also wrestled. So I didn't snowboard a ton. And uh, really the reason why I switched to skiing is I just got so jealous seeing the skiers just hop off the lift and just and just start going and ride up and not have to worry about bindings and stuff. Um, I know our buddy Russ at US Ski and Snowboard would uh, would disagree, but uh, but man, I this year I've been trying to practice jumps and I'll hit a jump going maybe five and it freaks me out. <laughs> so I can't imagine hitting a jump going 90. Um, and I think the fastest I've ever been on a ski, according to, you know, I, I have an app on my phone, so I don't know, yeah, yeah. I don't know how accurate that is, but yeah. I think I've gone like 47, it's pretty maybe, good. maybe yeah. 50. And it was just like, I mean, <laughs> I was, I was, I was puckered pretty good. Um, yeah. cause it was pretty icy conditions yeah. and the hill was really, you know, and I wasn't doing that for, for a whole, you know, down a whole mountain. <laughs> that was just probably like, yeah. you know, 10 feet or something. Yeah. I think like the, they clock average speed as well for a, an entire downhill run. So like a downhill race, I, I race downhill and super G. So on a downhill race, it, there's a, a start and a finish pretty much starts as high as you can go on the mountain, but finishes down in town and the average speeds top to bottom, it's maybe three to four miles long, the run. 
uh, two or 3,000 vertical feet of drop. And we're going like 120 kilometers an hour average speed. So that's like in the, the 60s to 80 range yeah. average speed, which is like if you were driving down the freeway in your car and you stick your head out the window, yeah. it's kind of kind of like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. It's a fun sport. I mean, I, I love all aspects of skiing, but racing downhill is like the pinnacle for me of what to, what you can do on skis The like the, the, the people prepare the slope perfectly. There's jumps. Um, the whole slope is like there's safety. So there's nets on the side for safety. Yeah. Um, the snow is perfect. Uh, and it just, it's, it's the perfect canvas, to like test what's possible on skis and push yourself. And, and then, and then to, to have success to actually win a race there, you, ha- you really have to like learn the Hills, learn when to push and when to hold back, um, learn how to manage the speed and the stress. And, and, and then your body has to be in peak physical shape. I mean, yeah. there's so many variables and then, and then the weather has to cooperate. You could have a, a tailwind and go way faster or a headwind and it kind of slows you down a little bit one little mistake and you lose a half a second and all of a sudden instead of winning your 15th place yeah so i mean there's just it's a tough sport it's it's brutal but it's it's super fun and when you actually do achieve a victory or an amazing result it's it just feels that much better too so well and <clears throat> this is one thing that i've talked about a, a handful of times is when you when you look at athletes at your level you guys make it look so easy so for people who don't ski, they're probably looking at that and being like, oh yeah, I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> but as somebody who just started skiing, <laughs> I can tell you that is, it's super hard. It's super hard to, to dig. I mean, you got to have a lot of uh, leg power to, uh, mm-hmm. to make those turns, especially at, at 90 miles an hour. I mean, even at 60 miles an hour, it's, yeah. you got to dig in really hard, especially how fast you guys turn. Yeah. I mean, we always joke around as athletes on tour, we always joke around. We like, we should have like a, a, a normal skier from the public come forerun the course before we start the race and, and film him and time him. And just to like put a little perspective into what we're doing, because yeah, you're right. All of us racers, even the guys who are getting 40th, 50th, 60th place, they're some of the best skiers in the world and, yeah. and, and, they, and it looks easy, but it's not at all. And the, and the main difference that people probably don't understand is the way that the snow is prepared it's not snow, what we're skiing on. They, it's, ice. They, it's ice. They take a, a hose from the snowmaking system and they turn on the valve and they just water down the entire slope uh, like two, three days before we show up. And then on a cold night, they groom it and seal it shut. And, and then each night, like or each day when we ski on it, the friction from us on the course makes the water like come up even more. And so it gets bumpier and icier and bumpier and icier. And I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not that fun skiing on ice. They do it. They do it as an insurance policy. So in case it's really warm and it rains or something the night before the race, they can still have the race Yeah. because if they cancel a race, it's uh, the, the sponsorship money, the yeah. host venue, there's, it's a lot of money on the line. So it's kind of an insurance policy so they can host it in, in marginal conditions. But growing up in California, I never skied on ice before. So for me, that was the, the toughest transition. Once I made it to the world cup was like the surface, the snow surface. It's, I mean, they might as well like bring a Zamboni down the mountain. That's kind of what we're skiing on. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I never thought about, that's a good point. Having somebody from the public <laughs> come and ski it, but you want to come I'm, try the next I, world cup. I was going to say, I think <laughs> I would be too scared, honestly. Like, I mean, I, I would ski down it, but it would probably take me at least 10, maybe 20 times longer than it would take yeah. to take you guys. Because, uh, cause yeah, I've skied on ice. I mean, up at uh, Deer Valley, they have some spots that get hit with the wind all the time. Okay. So, so you'll hit some some ice or some really really hard snow, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's 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 a little unnerving when you're going that fast because you if you know you, all you're thinking about is your ski slipping out, um, yeah. and that's just little parts, not a whole course. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think I, mean, I think I mean, I'd be terrified. Pretty- our equipment is pretty, pretty dialed in for yeah. those conditions. Um, so a- atomic is my ski sponsor and I have a, a factory serviceman. So, so he lives, he lives near Altenmark, Austria, where the factory is and he works at the factory. He, he picks out the skis I'm going to race with and he, he tunes them and then he travels with me. And so we test different skis, different, uh, stiffnesses, different side yeah. cuts, different base materials. We, we spend the whole summer training on all these different skis to try to find what works the best in each condition. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's similar to like formula one, like we're, we're looking for hundreds of a second and, yeah. and, and the equipment plays a huge role in that. If the boots 
are dialed, if, if the binding position on the ski is dialed, and if the wax, the edges, everything, there's all these things that you, you check, check, check those boxes and you get to the point where you can, you can push hard down these really icy, technical, dangerous slopes. And without that, I mean, that's the other thing. If, if somebody on just normal recreational skis tried to ski down the slopes, they wouldn't be able to. They would, yeah. they would hit like the first turn or the first compression or the first steep part and slide out and go into the fence. So it's yeah. Like, yeah, it's. That, that's, that's crazy to think about. I mean, I think that's with most sports, but I think it's easy for, for us as spe- spectators to forget about all the tiny mm-hmm. little things. I mean, even nutrition, you know, yeah. plays, plays a big factor in all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I got a great question from Mandy. She says, where's your favorite place to ski and or compete? Okay. Um, so yeah, this will be a two part answer, I think, because I grew up obviously skiing at Squaw Valley and this resort is by far my favorite place in the world to ski just because the terrain is, is so varied and, and steep and there's cliffs and, and amazing terrain. I mean, yeah. there's so many good skiers that have come out of here and I, and, and nobody understands why, like we don't have a better ski team or coaching staff or training, like ski, like race training venue, but just the mountain itself is so difficult that no matter what level of, ski, of skier you are, it'll continue to teach you yeah. the skills you need to have success. And so like, even now when I came home, mid season for a little break, I, I went skiing and, and it's, it's challenges me still. I'm, I'm racing the toughest downhill courses in the world. And I come home and I can like still push my limits at my home mountain. It's, it's, there's not a lot of places that are like that. Like you ski in, in Colorado or, or other places. And it's kind of all the same. Like you could, you yeah. could close your eyes and go to the top of or mid mountain of any resort in Colorado and open your eyes and you wouldn't know where you were. They're yeah. all kind of like open tree runs and, and real perfect snow and easy, easy skiing. Like it's effortless. It's fun yeah. for public, but as a professional skier, I really like the, the iconic challenging gnarly conditions and terrain. And, and I get that here at home all the time, which is it's a perfect training ground. Um, and then as far as competition goes in Europe, there's so many iconic, beautiful venues, so much history behind the sport and, and two, two in particular, uh, Vengen in Switzerland, it's the Laberhorn run. It's the longest running world cup downhill on the tour. And it's this beautiful mountain setting in Switzerland, this little village with a seven kilometer long downhill track. There's trains that you take to get to the start. There's <laughs> not really, it's not really a skier. You hop on this old cog railway and it brings you up to the start, the, the downhill track. There's actually a tunnel that you ski under the train halfway down the downhill track. And they, they say if, if the train's crossing the tunnel while you're in your race run and you go under the tunnel, it's good luck, apparently. <laughs> so, I haven't had it happen yet and I haven't won there yet. So, um, <laughs> but uh, there's just all these like beautiful, iconic European mountain towns that we get to go travel to. And in Bangan, there's 80,000 fans that come and watch us in a normal year. With, with COVID, obviously, we haven't had fans yeah. this season, but um, it's unreal having 80,000 spectators on the side of a mountain cheering you on. The, the Swiss Air Force comes out and they fly their jets around. They do an air show before the race. It's just like an amazing atmosphere. And, and yeah, the, the ski racing in Europe is similar to like football in the US. Like yeah. it's, it's, their, it's their, big, their biggest sport in, this, in the Alps, in the mountains there. And, and yeah, people love it. So it's, it's fun being a ski racer in Europe for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's completely different. And even so I've, I've watched ski jumping here in, uh, in, in Park City. Um, I think it was Olympic trials. So it's, it's a big deal, right? Yeah. There's like a handful of people and most of the people were from Europe mm-hmm. that were there. Yeah. And yeah. then I went, this was a handful of years ago, I went to Slovenia mm-hmm. and it was right on the border of Italy. They, uh, I think it's called Planita, Planita? and Planitza, Planitza. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, I watched ski jumping there yeah. And there was like so many people that it just makes, well, they call it ski flying because the hill yeah. is so big. But yeah, yeah. again, like the, the, the atmosphere just makes mm-hmm. it that much it more enjoyable, fun. you know, yeah. like it, yeah. and probably for you guys as well when you're competing. Yeah. I mean, the energy is unbelievable. It's when you're, when you're a rookie and you go to these venues for the first time, it's really distracting because all of a sudden there's there's thousands and thousands of fans screaming and, and walking around and you're just kind of mm-hmm. trying to fight your way even get to the lift and and they're they want your autograph and they're taking photos and there's bands playing music and they're drinking and it's yeah. just like a, a huge party in the mountains it's crazy and yeah as an as a as a rookie athlete that can be very distracting and when you're trying to compete yeah. um 
but yeah, once you kind of embrace that and, and can still focus on the racing, you can use that energy to really like pull out some big performances. So like this year has been kind of weird without the fans yeah. around. It's been, it's been kind of like, it's felt like it, like, it, like we've been training Train, yeah. all summer. Yeah. Cause we, we, uh, yeah, we just show up. There's no fans. We do our thing. It's, it's much more simple, but you're just missing that, like that energy. energy yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we have a question from Michelle. Uh, she says, how long have you been a USANA athlete? We went over that for a little bit. It's just been a handful of months, but she says, how has it affected your performance? Yeah. So I've, I've been a USANA athlete for actually, so, so the USANA has been a, a partner with the US ski yeah. team for a long, long time. So when I first made the US ski team, I, I started having access to some of USANA's products. And so I'm not, I'm pretty familiar with their products. I've been using them for a while. And, and as a professional athlete, I mean, the nutrition and, and, and making sure everything is, is dialed in is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to performance. So yeah, like getting good sleep for me is one of the most substantial things that helps you yep. compete. And when you're at big events, big races, it's hard to sleep because there's so much stress. You're, you're overthinking things. You just, you need, sometimes you just need a little help quieting your mind. And so, yeah, like the pure rest supplement from sauna is a huge help when I'm traveling and competing, it helps me just kind of get a good night's sleep and wake up fresh. Um, and yeah, like since I've been working more directly with USANA, it's been better just to learn more about their products and become more involved with the company. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty new. It's only been a couple months. So I'm looking forward to, to growing our partnership and, and seeing how I can benefit more from their products as I lead into the, the Olympics next year in Beijing and, and then beyond. I mean, I hopefully I'll race for a few more years after that too. So for sure. So, and we need to have you out so you can check out the facility, do a tour and yeah. see everything that goes into, into I was going to try to go out there right now, but I, with COVID yeah. and travel restrictions and things, it was just a little bit too yeah. complicated. So next time I'll try to make my way out there, which I'm not going to lie. Like I was, I was excited to, uh, to see you and, and, but I was a little nervous to go skiing with you. I'm not going to lie. When you <laughs> said you wanted to go skiing, I was like, Ooh, yeah, that, that might be, that might be interesting. <laughs> I, I love skiing so much and I don't, it doesn't matter what kind of skiing you do and who you go skiing with. Yeah. I just love showing people around the mountain and, and just having a good time. Like it's, yeah, it's such a fun sport. Like skiing is such a generational sport. You can go ski with your niece and nephew, yeah. your grandparents, your parents. Like it's, it's a, such a good family outdoor active, like healthy activity to do. It's, I love it. Yeah. So no, don't be worried. We'll, we'll, we'll go ski. We'll take it easy. <laughs> Teach you how to jump a little more. There we go. There we yeah. go. Um, yeah. yeah. I was trying to get, uh, um, Alex Ferreira to teach me, or actually Devin Logan was going to teach me how to do a backflip. I've never okay. done a backflip. So, um, nice. definitely not on skis. We were going to, we were oh. going to do it up at okay. the, uh, USANA center of excellence first, and yeah, then yeah. maybe wait, work our way over to the, uh, um, the jumps where you jump into the, to the water over there at Park yeah. City. The no, I mean, I, as a, at the ski racer, like I've actually spent a lot of time at the USANA center of excellence in those foam pits and the trampolines yeah. at, in Park City. It's, they're so fun. Yeah. They, there's been a few like injuries from ski racers and other athletes playing around in there, but at, when they first opened the set and so they're not really wanting us to go in there much anymore, but yeah. when they first opened the center. It was so fun to go there and jump on the trampolines and just play around in the foam pits and you can, yeah, you can learn a lot. So, it's a good way to learn safely, I guess, compared yeah. to just doing it on skis on snow for the first time. So. The first time I jumped in there, I went head first. Like yeah. I, I tried like maybe a couple flips or something, went head first and didn't realize how hard it was going to be to get yeah. out, like to oh, dig yeah. yourself out of that pit. You're just swimming in the foam for a while, like trying to breathe. You're, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> you're claustrophobic and you can be a little tough. But So I want to jump into, I know this is probably a sensitive subject, but 2017, the end of the season, you ended up missing um, the tail end of the season because of an ACL injury. It was right, yeah. um, which also lasted through the Olympics. How how was that like overcoming that mentally? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that must have been super super hard. And have you been able to take that and use that as an advantage in making you a better skier? Yeah. So that, the timing of that was actually a little bit different. I, I was injured the end of December, 2017. And the Olympics were about three weeks away, four weeks away. So I was gearing up for the Olympics. My second Olympics, uh, the, the first, my first Olympics, I was fifth place in the downhill, which was the best oh. men's downhill result since Tommy Moe won yep. in, uh, in Lillehammer. And so I, I, my rookie Olympic performance, I was really close to getting a medal and I was like really excited to get back and have a second shot. And then in Bormio, Italy, 
December 27th or something, I, I, uh, it was, it was dumping snow the night before the race and the conditions were a little marginal and we had like three hours of delays after inspection while they were trying to get snow off the track and try to get the surface ready to race because for safety reasons and, to, and just yeah. to make it a fair race. And, um, finally they, they called the race on and got all fired up, got ready to go. And, and I pushed a little bit too hard in one section and I hit a hole and kind of got high sided and just flipped around and, and the crash wasn't that bad, but then I went into the nets and my skis didn't come off and I got all twisted up yeah. in the net and yeah, blew up my ACL and meniscus really bad. And it was in a really precarious spot on the hill too. I, I, they couldn't come rescue me with the helicopter because it was too steep and there was a chairlift above us. And so they, they brought a, a sled over with the ski patrol and tried to sled me down this super steep hill and it was injected ice and the ski patrol almost lost me. I was like digging in with my fingertips to try not to slide down oh. the hill out of control. And I was like all cut up on my hands from trying not to, yeah, anyway, it was, it was a tough crash. And, and obviously I was really bummed out to miss the Olympics, um, but it gave me, it was the first time in my career that I had a break from competition. Like, in hindsight, looking back, up until that point, I had never had a break. I had trained all summer, competed all winter for 13 years in a row. And I was getting to the point in my career where I was like, I was having fun, but I wasn't having as much fun. I was, I was a little bit getting burnt out maybe. Yeah. And, and it was, it was kind of turning more into a job and I was kind of maybe taking it for granted a little bit. I was kind of starting to think about other things in life and yeah, it just was, it was starting to become like a grind a little bit. And so blew up my knee. All of a sudden I was back home in the winter rehabbing, not even able to walk for the first six, eight, eight weeks, actually I was on crutches and, and I, it gave me some time just to kind of unwind and like reflect on all those years of competing. Yeah. And, and before that, you never, you, you rarely have time to like actually sit down and think about things. And, and it, it, that, that forced break gave me a lot of time to reflect on, on who I was as a person, who I was as an athlete and kind of was, I was able to rebuild my fire to keep going. I think there, there is a study that the French ski team did that their athletes who had season ending ACL injuries ended up competing for lo like for longer and ended up having more podiums than the ones who never got injured. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said for, I mean, it sucks getting injured. You don't want that, but yep. just having a break and like, and like having time, time off is so important to, for your mind, for your body. I had back pain like before my knee injury and then I hurt my knee and I was on crutches and I had a forced break. My back pain went away. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, and I, and, and I got re-motivated to come back and, and my, so my girlfriend's on the Canadian national team and That's three right. weeks before, three weeks before she blew out her knee as well. And so she blew out her ACL three weeks later, I blew out my ACL. We were both going to go to the Olympics, for, uh, competing for our countries. And so all of a sudden we're back home and, and thankfully we were doing the same rehab. It was, it was perfect to be with another athlete in the same position and working together and working hard. And, and yeah. I mean, we, we spent, all we did was, was wake up and do rehab, go to the gym, see the physical therapist all that winter, all that spring, all that summer. And honestly, we both came back stronger and more fit and the, the mental thing took, took, took longer, like mentally getting back into the start gate after a big injury. It's, it's really tough learning how to push yourself again and take risks. So that took some time, but as far as our, our physical shape and, and yeah, our motivation levels, like it was, it was crazy to, to think that a, a big setback like that would lead to future success. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, it was, it's, it was unfortunate timing with missing the games, but all in all, I think now, I'm hungrier than ever and and my body's probably healthier than it was eight, nine years ago, just because I'm I, I I relearned how to be a professional athlete and what what it takes to recover and and treat your body well and and yeah. Anyways, that's long awesome. Story today, no, no, that that's awesome. Um movement, movement evolution Scotland asks, and this is a great question. When did you realize you had the potential to be a World Cup racer? That is a good question. Yeah, I think, I mean, growing up here in Squaw Valley, uh, we have the, the Mighty Might program. There's 1,200 kids in the program. It's a, it's a big, big program. And the, the coaches are all ex, like, world-class athletes. They're, they're amazing. And, and, and when you have that many kids together in a group pushing each other on the mountain, you end up creating amazing skiers. And, and so our, my team had amazing skiers, and we were always pushing each other. And, 
and the also the the olympic like legacy in squaw valley every yeah. day when you drive into the valley there's the olympic torch burning there's the olympic rings the history of ski racing in this place and skiing in general is just very inspirational and so after after the Mitomite program when i was on the squaw valley ski team uh, i had tamara mckinney as a coach who was a world cup overall winner world, and won multiple gs globes i had greg jones as a coach who had won world championship medals and and world and podium in world cups I had all these amazing athletes who were coaching us now. And so I, I think I always knew more or less growing up in this place and comparing myself to my friends and just skiing around the mountain. And I, I kind of always knew that I was headed down that path. Yeah. Um, I don't, there wasn't like one distinct moment where I was like, I think I have a chance at this. I think I just, I don't know. My whole life was like building up to this moment. I more or less like I lived and breathed skiing. I grew up in the mountains. My back, my backyard was a, a, a mountain. I could go like ski touring at my back door. Um, and my sister was on the US ski team. So my older sister was on the US ski oh, okay. team. As well. So I, I kind of followed in her footsteps a bit. And as a kid, we would travel around to all of her big races. And I was just kind of like ingrained into the ski racing scene. And my, my dad was the US ski team doctor. And so he would travel with the team and I would join them when I was really young and go to camps. Like I was, I think the first one I was maybe 11 or 12 years old and I went to Sold in Austria. And like, I first, that's when I first met like Lindsey Vaughn and like Julia and, and yeah, they, I like, I got to like ski their course as a little kid. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So I, I just cool. always was kind of born into this sport and yeah, like even before that, my, my grandfather, he built himself wooden skis in high school way back in the day before anyone was really skiing much in California. And he, he climbed Mount Baldy, which is his peak outside of LA yeah. and just taught himself how to ski. And, and from that, my, my dad and my aunts and uncles all grew up skiing. And then my dad decided to live in the mountains and, and I grew, I got to grow up with, this is my, with Tahoe as my backyard. And so, yeah, I, I just love it. And it led me to now this place where I'm competing on the world stage and I've been doing it for a long time and I've had success and, it hasn't been easy, but it's, I've loved every second of it. So, yeah. Nice. So we just have time for a, a couple more questions. Um, I think we've actually gone over, but there's, okay. there's one thing I wanted to go over with, uh, and, and I mean that out of respect for you and your time. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really have a time limit. So I need to go pack. I'm, I'm flying back to Europe tomorrow yeah. and I haven't even started laundry yet. So I got, yeah. <laughs> wow. And, and speaking of that, you're going to Europe and I think you're doing an Instagram takeover for yeah. Usana, right? Well, you're back. Yeah, exactly. In so in a couple of days, I'm, we're flying to, or we're flying to Munich, driving into Austria. And then we have three days training in Riederalm, which is this amazing training venue in Austria. And so I was going to try to do an Instagram takeover, um, on one of those training days, just kind of showing what I do in the morning, my warm up, what we do on the Hill, some training, what we do for recovery how we eat all these, all these, all the parts of kind of what yeah. the training looks like. So it, it's intriguing. It's intriguing. So yeah. if you guys want to see that, you know, go check out Usana's Instagram page and, uh, and you could see, uh, Travis's takeover. But before we go, there's something that I kept seeing, uh, you know, like, uh, when I did a little bit of research back in, back in the day, but, but before we signed you, um, you say that you think it's important to push yourself to be better but equally important to have fun during the process. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like that's kind of a big deal to you to push yourself, but also make sure you're, you're having fun. What, why, why that philosophy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's all about just finding balance in whatever you're doing. I think for me as a, I, 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 th I thrive on competition, but I also despise competition. I, I love to ski for myself and to ski with friends and just to go have these amazing fun experiences in the mountain. And so when I have to go all of a sudden and compete on the world stage, sometimes it, it becomes a little bit forced and, and yeah. I don't know, I, I love it. It makes, it brings out these amazing performances, but at the same time, I need that balance of like remembering like, Hey, I'm having fun. Like I love the mountains. This is like, I would be doing this no matter what, this is, this is like the most fun thing in the world that I could be doing anyways. Yeah. And so I think, remembering those things just kind of helps helps you get through these like really tough mental days and these competitions and and helps ground you and, and also just helps you like after the races you can go do something else that that kind of just brings you back to neutral i don't know yeah. if you're always turned on yeah like and competing it's it's easy to get burnt out and 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 become flat and so i think yeah my whole career i've just tried to remember that skiing is super fun and and competing's fun and, and 
I'm going to push myself to my limits, but I'm going to do it while having the most fun of anyone out there. Even if it's raining and bad conditions and whatever, yeah. I'm just going to enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a lucky thing I get to do. So, cause I think that would be the, a hard balance because I can tell you love skiing so much, but then mm -hmm. all the competition and always try, you know, having to be on could start feeling like maybe a job you don't like so much. So yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, that's great that you can, that you can balance that out. Yeah. I mean, I, I came home to have like a break from the tour and try to rest. And I've literally skied every single day. I like <laughs> stop skiing. I don't know. I don't get like the ski touring right out the back door is amazing. So I just, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the hill and I'm like, I guess I'll go do a lap. And I just throw my skins on and go do a little run back behind the house. And yeah. just for me, it's, it's just grounding and it's, it's so different from ski racing and it's, it's uh, just gives me energy and, and re refills the tanks. And yeah, it's nice to have that outlet. So last question. And I always ask the athletes this question before we go. So is there one thing um, that, that you do every day and maybe it's, it's, it's some advice to the people watching or something that you do every day that doesn't take a lot of time that's helped you immensely, whether it's, you know, meditation or, mm -hmm. you know, something you do for 20 seconds or 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty specific, but every time before I push out of the start gate, whether it's a race or a training run, I, I, they count down like 30 seconds and then 15 seconds and then three, two, one, go. And like right around the, the 30 to 15 second mark, I, I always try just to like look out at the view and, and take a second just to like totally soak in where you're myself out. down and, and enjoy the scenery. And I like look out at the view and I'm just like soaking it all in. I don't know, just trying to be present. And, and, and then, and then like the five second uh, tone starts and that, that's when I know it. Then that's when I switch back into like full competition race mode. But like just doing that one thing I've learned has helped, helps me kind of hone in on what I'm going to do and like reminds me to enjoy what I'm doing, I guess. And yeah, it's the, the downhill races start at the very top of every mountain. So the view is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's fun, but I think that's important. I think just taking time every once in a while, just to like hit the pause button and, and reflect on what you're about to do or what you're doing and it helps you live in the moment. And then you stop thinking about results and what's going to happen later and what's happened before. And you just live in the moment. I yeah. Think that's important. And I think everybody can, can do that in a sense, like, you know, hit, hitting the pause button um, and just realizing how good you have it. Totally. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've traveled with our foundation quite a bit and there's, there's a lot of people who are happier than we are that have much less than we do, you know, exactly. and, 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 and sometimes I think it's easy to forget how good we have it. So that's, that's great advice. Just hit the pause button and yeah. uh, just be grateful for what you have. So yeah. cool. Yeah. Travis, thanks. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time again. I know you're, uh, you're, you're getting ready for Europe. So it's probably was one of the last things you wanted to do while you still have <laughs> packing and everything else to do. But before we go, do you want to show us your view? I think it'd be, oh. you've got a pretty awesome setup yeah. there and, uh, and you're pretty mobile. So let's the internet will stick with us here. But yeah, <laughs> this is a, I'm actually at my parents' house. Um, this is where I grew up and that's, that's Alpine Meadows kind of behind us. And then, you know, the sun's right at us, but, um, and then Squaw Valley is just up over here on this side. That's the backside of KT. Um, yeah. So, so you literally can just walk out your door, put the skins on and do a few laps. Oh yeah. No, it's pretty ideal. I mean, my, my dad is a, a local doctor here and he has a clinic over in Squaw Valley. And so he actually skins up and over the mountain and skis down to work in the morning. And then after work, he skis, he skins back up and skis back to the house. And so I actually, I grew up uh, skinning with him in the morning before school, I would skin up to the Ridge and then I would ski back to the house, go to school and he would ski to work. What a so great example of, uh, and that's really cool that he, uh, that he does that to commute, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, just little things like that just help, help yeah. the heart, you know, yeah. work better. The muscles flow. Sure. So. I mean, I wrote a, I wrote an, uh, an article for, for this university class I'm taking called the art of the commute. And I, and I use that example in it a fair amount. It's pretty, I mean, if everybody did that every day, it, the world would be a much different place for sure. So. There you go. There's the second <laughs> bit of awesome advice. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Cool. Thanks again for joining us. Good luck in Europe and uh, and the upcoming games. I know everybody who's watching is going to be cheering you on and uh, and super excited to, to have you as a USANA athlete. So thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.